I always ask this question. Now, this, this shit's like more of like a discussion-based thing, something I throw out to people. But I always ask, you know, to kind of get us into this, into this, you know, lecture and thinking is like, could hip-hop music pre-exist hip-hop culture? And you have to think like, wow, that's kind of a fucked up question, Andre. Like, like you're asking us crazy shit. Like, no, <laughs> you know, but you, you know, cause how could a musical form pre-exist the music and culture that gave birth to it? But you know, in so many ways, like what is hip hop music? It's like taking any I mean, what is hip hop in general? It's taking anything, any piece of music, art, clothing, film, whatever, right? Words, whatever. And you take those elements, you take those bits and pieces and, you know, you chop them up, you add your own spices to it and you present it in a hip hop fashion. So for music, fuck yeah, like almost all of the break beats, all the music that became like core foundational breaks of hip hop music, rock music, psych rock music, a ton of funk, a ton of soul, um, surf rock, I mean, just everything, whatever, became hip hop music because a DJ, you know what I'm saying, found those, those songs that had these incredible drum breaks on them, like you should have listened to um, in our playlist. Um, right, found these incredible drum breaks on these thing, on these pieces of music, right, and then brought them into to hip hop and put them in a hip hop form, put them in a new context, you know. So I'm always like, all music is hip hop music, you know. It just needs to have a DJ or a beat maker, someone with that 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 touch, you know, get their hands on that piece of music. Anything can become hip hop. It's just. It has to get in the right, the right, the right hand. So hell yeah, the music could pre-exist the culture, you know. But it took the culture to bring the music and make it hip hop, right? Like I take country, a country, country record with with a drum break on it, and I make it a hip, I make it a hip hop thing. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like n nothing safe from becoming hip hop is it really what we're trying to say here. So I'd ask you to read through Dick Hebdige's uh, chapter um, from Cut and Mix, which is kind of a pretty important book that he wrote about, um, you know, art, the sound clash in Jamaica, appropriation, musical authorship, etc. within, you know, that culture. Um, and let's just say this, like, the Jamaican sound clash culture had a major influence on, on hip hop, um, okay, and what what was the sound clash? The sound clash w w was this: these big battles where, you know, a Jamaican selector, which is a, a what we would call a DJ, is a selector in Jamaica, right? Um, and their crew would build these massive walls of sound, you know, um, their sound system. They'd build their speaker cabinets, like they'd architect, you know, art, you know, make these, design these, and they build these massive walls of sound. And the uh, selecta would also find themselves, you know, from producers, these dub records, these records where you get a 45, and on one side is the vocal version, on the on the B side is the instrumental version it's the dub it's got more bass to it it's just got a different sound um it, in jamaica they call they call basically a beat you know a rhythm um and 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 different artists you know try to get up on 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 a rhythm um it's a little bit different than in the united states where the vocalist is is you know up there in jamaica is the the, the rhythm the beat maker you know everybody wanted to get on the um you know bam bam rhythm or, or whatever and so these selectors would try to, you know, have the most, you know, exclusive rhythms. And then in the sound clash culture, the, the, the person who, the vocalist was known as the DJ. It makes things really fucking confusing. And what they would do is, you know, the, the, the DJ would get on the mic and they would do what they call toasting, where they'd get on and they'd sing, they'd improvise, they'd rhyme a little bit, maybe throw a little diss at the other crew. 
You know what I'm saying? And typically, you know, the, the battle was for who had the loudest system, who had like the best rhythms, the most exclusive rhythms, who had the best DJ, you know, toasting people on, on the microphone. Okay. Um, so that kind of gives you a, a sense of what that was, right? And so they go out into the tenement yard in Kingston or different parts of Jamaica, you know, um, and they t two different crews would set up their their um, sound systems and, and they, bat they, they basically battle, you know. Um, and so Cool Herc, right, we, we talk about, you know, as being like a major, you know, the, the inventor, so to speak, of hip hop in the United States. He's from Kingston, so he saw all this stuff and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the interesting thing about the Jamaican sound clash and the sound system culture is that, you know, uh, there was a feedback loop with the audience like the because nothing was routine because nothing was necessarily pre-planned you know the artists fed off the vibe of, of the audience and that was a major thing the audience was part of the production they were part of the show and that was a major part of, of hip-hop that was a major part of punk you know all these different types of music where like the feedback um loop between artist and and audience was was major it's way different with what you have now with concerts right that's that's you're there to see a show you're not really part of the show um, you're there seeing the show Kanye West is floating over you you know which is so fucking stupid but um you know and Hebdige says this and it was uh you know it is at the sound system that the barrier between the fans and the stars is least is least noticeable you know, and that's a ma that's a, a major thing. You're kind of on the same level. You're a, a active participant in the production of the culture, even if you're in the audience. You know, um, and Hebdige says this: the original version takes on new life and meaning in a fresh context. He's talking about a version of you know someone taking a dub and then toasting over it, right? It, it's just like that improvisational part right gives it new meaning in this new contest and I love this part like everybody uh, has a chance to make a contribution so it's democratic you know what I'm saying uh, wow Hawk just flew down onto my truck um, and no one's version is treated as holy writ right meaning like and this is so important in hip-hop culture right because meaning like when someone records a song that's not like scribed in in um, in stone, that shit's written on, damn, there she goes, uh, that shit's written on, you know, a dry erase board, you know what I'm saying, the artist who makes it in so many ways, and the record label who puts it out thinks it's, like, it's, here's a record, it's, it's set in stone, you know, but, like, that's just the, the starting point, and, and I think, like, that's the thing what he's saying is, like, someone makes a rhythm, and, that's just the starting point. You know, that's not the end point. Consumption of it is not the end point. That's the starting point for making, making new, new music and culture. And that's a major part of, of hip hop. Um, so the sound clash had a major influence on hip hop culture. Then we have other things, um, you know, uh, Kung Fu movies, uh, you know, were major in New York City in the 60s and 70s had a major influence on specifically b-boying and b-girling, but like like a, a lot of these young brothers and sisters were into kung fu movies, you know, and, and there's no no secret that's part of the reason why it became a major part of Wu-Tang's whole, whole, whole vibe. Um, James Brown, the dance moves of James Brown, um, Latin soul, Latin funk, um, that type of music had a major influence on the culture, the... Um, you know, Brazilian dance, etc. And then actually disco in a weird way, um, in the sense of, you know, disco music was made for adults. Um, but disco actually started um, in New York City in the late 60s with DJs and mostly, you know, gay, basically gay, gay clubs who would play funk and soul and rock music and they would try to blend it together and create like this this vibe and that was what discos were discotheques and disco music was <clears throat> and then what started happening is you know um a song would come out and 
uh, a DJ, a disco DJ, would remix it and cut it onto, you know, piece, uh, cut it onto a record and give it out to other DJs and they'd play it. And, um, you know, eventually record labels caught on and then they started, they're like, oh, look at all these people going to these discotheques. And, oh, they like, they like versions of our songs with a big intro drum break and a long outro drum break. So, um, yeah, well, let's just make stuff like the Bee Gees and, you know, let's make the bullshit that you know is disco music. That was like years later. But hip hop actually brought in a lot of the DJ techniques, um, you know, using slip mats on turntables or backspinning records or slip cueing records, which I'll, I'll show when I talk more about DJ technique. Um, I'll demonstrate those techniques for y'all so you know, know, what, I'm know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 